Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in Canada, and welcome to the Kidney Cancer Canada Drug Therapies webinar. My name is Stephen Andrew, and I am the Executive Director of Kidney Cancer Canada, and I'm coming to you today from Victoria, British Columbia. A little bit of an overview of what we're going to be doing today. We are going to uh, look at the um, a brief introduction of Kidney Cancer Canada, what we do here uh, and our organization and the program we, we have available. Then we'll have our panelist presentations. We'll do some question and answers, a brief wrap up, and then we'll just have a, a couple of questions for you. So first of all, a little bit about Kidney Cancer Canada. Well, we're a national organization, a community of patients, caregivers, and health professionals who work to provide every Canadian touch uh, by kidney cancer with the support, education, and advocacy for their care pathways and their treatment options. We do this through a number of ways. One is through support. We try to make sure that everyone has the support they need uh, through either one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, peer support or in meeting situations or on our website at kidneycancercanada.ca. It's a great way to connect with other patients and caregivers across the country, and there's a lot of discussion there, so please look at that. We also have education and information. Uh, we provide that through a number of meetings through our website at kidneycancercanada.ca, and you can download a lot of information from our website as well. Of course, we have our monthly newsletter. And through advocacy, we advocate for access and treatment options, for the best treatment options for patients in Canada across the province. And we, we do that on a continual basis. And when new therapies come available, we certainly, uh, when the clinicians tell us that it's something they need, we work to ensure that that um, product or that new uh, treatment option is presented as quickly as possible to you, the patient. And as I mentioned, you can find that all at kidneycancercanada.ca. If you would like more information on Kidney Cancer Canada, you can download the About Kidney Cancer Canada booklet, which you'll find to the side of your screen just there if you have a, a look you can see it's a pdf about kidney cancer canada and you can download that at any time through this webinar that we are now on so i'm now going to ask louise godbo to join us she is joining us from toronto at sunnybrook hospital and she'll be shutting her camera on and uh, mm -hmm. she's gonna be if she's a pharmacist uh, from uh, at sunnybrook and uh, Louis Zell will be taking us through the uh, the first part of our presentation. Are you there, Louis Zell? I'm on, and I must say, I'm in Ottawa, not in Toronto. Oh, so I'm in the Ottawa. My apologies. You're in Ottawa. I do apologize. So oh. um, I don't see a camera today, but uh, you can at least go ahead with your presentation. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, so I'm going to. Thank you. Going to talk to you about drugs, the drug interaction and management side effects. I just have a few slides to let you know what we're going to talk, but I'm going to leave most of the discussion to you to ask the sort of people presenting any question you would like to hear. I'm going to go through oral agents first, and then I'm going to go talk very briefly about the injectable agents. So the oral agents, aha, glitch. Uh, are, oops, one sec, I'll get the right slide up here, I'm sorry, it's, uh, we just had a bit of an yeah. issue there, and I can't, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll find them for you, just, if you just ask for the slides, we will find them from here for you, so you're starting with the oral, uh, oral agents, uh, that is your, yes, that is the first slide, I believe. One second, I'll just come to it. It's the vascular and epithelial yep. agents. Yep. It's coming right the at you. The slide about the blood vessels. Next slide. Yeah, it's just not firing. There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so these agents, what we call VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor receptors, act on the blood vessels. What they do is they interrupt blood vessels to your tumor, so your tumor doesn't have the nutrients it needs to grow. So it stops it from growing, and then your body takes over and kills these tumor cells. 
So next slide are the drugs that will work on at this level. And I, okay, so you have your sunitinib, fazopinib, axitinib. I'm sure you're all very familiar with them. And uh, I had slides of what the pills look like, but it doesn't seem to be wanting to load. Oh, there it is. And some of these are in variable strength. Some, the bevacizumab is the only one in this group that is used in kidney cancer that is an injectable form. So we also have the mTOR inhibitors, which have a slightly different mechanism of action. They have some common toxicities, but a few different uh, toxicities also. So you would have your everolimus, and the injectable one is your temsorolimus, which, uh, again, I'm having difficulty loading. There it is, everolimus and temsorolimus. So um, some of the drug interactions that you have to look after is drug-drug interactions. So uh, is the other drug that you're taking going to be decreasing the effect of your cancer drug? Or is it going to increase the effects or is it going to increase side effects? Uh, if it decreases side effects, that usually is a good combination to have. But drugs that increase side effects, we want to stay away from. You also have to look at food interaction. Is it going to decrease in absorption? or is it going to decrease or increase metabolism? And this is where your grapefruit juice comes into play. It decreases metabolism, therefore increasing the serum concentration, therefore you're getting more blood, more blood level of the drug and causing more toxicity. And environmental issues, usually these drugs are very, um, cause sensitivity, so phototoxicity is what we call it. So your, sun, your skin becomes much more, um, Sensitive to the sun, you will burn more easily, so it is very important that you use a sunscreen when you're outside while you're on these agents. Um, it also can cause skin rashes, uh, which can cause irritation, and to prevent those, the best thing to do is to use a well, a nice moisturizing cream. Do it regularly, whether you have a skin rash or not, it will prevent some of these toxicities. Diarrhea is a common one and um, we can go through some of the management for that, nausea and fatigue. And we can go through some of the management of that depending on your, your questions that you will have. So I'm available for questions, don't know. If well, I'll, t I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll bring in uh, Dawn Knight now. She is a nurse out of Sunnybrook. Uh, Dawn, i get you to shut your uh, camera and your um, mic on. Uh, hello. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure I'll to have you there. Out. Good. You. Now, if you have questions for our panelists today, you can uh, type them in to the uh, sidebar there at the chat sidebar, and you'll find that located right at the side of your screen. So that should uh, come up. Just so you type them in there, and we will uh, see your questions. And as soon as we get a couple of questions for you, ladies, we will do that. And uh, just a, a note to Mona, I uh, I actually can't see the questions here in Victoria, so I may have to go to you for uh, to read the questions, Mona. Okay. So uh, first of all, let's start with uh, Louiselle. Uh, Louiselle, uh, just a, a very brief, what's the most common drug that we find being used in uh, Canada right now? I think sunitinib is, or sutent is the one that we use most commonly as our first line agent. I know that in this area, in Ontario, that is the most common one. Um, I can't really say for the rest of the provinces but I think it's still the one that is mostly, and there's several reasons for that, is that the literature that suggests that it is efficacious is very strong. It's been on the market for a long time. Physicians know how to use it, and there's a lot of way of dosing it. So anybody who runs into problems with sunitinib, we can find a way to dose it so that the patient can actually tolerate it at some point. 
the uh, conventions that I go to and the uh, conferences and talking about the dosing dawn, maybe you'd like to talk a, a little bit about that uh, at Sunnybrook, that uh, the clinicians, and I know Dr. Bjornsson at uh, Sunnybrook definitely, I mean, he, when I spoke to him many years ago when I was on suit as a patient, he said that, you know, metronomics was important taking the drug at nighttime. But we, in Canada, I'm hearing that the clinicians here are becoming very apt at being able to adjust scheduling and, and are becoming extremely um, uh, adept at, at providing the right dosage at the right time for individualization. Mm -hmm. We're finding that there's a, a really large trend uh, to individualized treatment. Um, the literature is uh, very strong in showing that by individualizing the treatments, whether your, your first line or second line um, treatments that Patients respond better. Uh, we're able to manage the toxicities better. Uh, patients can tolerate the drugs longer. Um, and we don't have to move patients onto third and fourth line treatments um, sooner than they need to go on those, those treatments. So absolutely. Let's, let's, let's just talk a bit about first. So first line is the first drug you take. If that drug was to not receive a good response, you would be put on another drug, and that is typically called your second line, right? That's correct. So, Just so that people understand. Right. So your first line drugs are typically your sutant, your excitinib, your pezopinib, and then uh, patients uh, would then be transitioned onto the everlimus um, as your sort of your second line, um, uh, and then patients typically would then transition into either um, a, a clinical trial and or an immunotherapy, uh, which as we know is is relatively new within the last year and a half, two years, um, and now that we have the um, government support uh, for the immunotherapies, we are seeing you know, that a little bit more and more. Um, and then we would uh, then look at a fourth line, which would then be getting into your, your chemotherapies. Yeah, we're going to be talking about immunotherapy, by the way, a little bit later in the webinar today. So we do have some questions going in. So we'll go up to uh, Quebec. And Mona, our first question is from who? Our first question is from Ina Shabasol. How do you manage magnesium level with diarrhea when OTC magnesium does not work? That's a great question. <laughs> um, magnesium levels are very difficult to maintain when you have diarrhea. And really using the oral forms uh, cause more diarrhea. So you're probably best taking some banana or some element of some uh, food that has magnesium. Your green leafy vegetables have magnesium, bananas have magnesium, so that probably is a better way of doing it. The other thing is if you do have diarrhea, it's very important to keep hydrated. So you need to keep drinking no matter what. You may think that it will increase your diarrhea, but you just need to replace the fluids that you're losing. Don, what do I you say? I don't know, Don, if you have other suggestions. Yeah, Louise, I definitely agree with you in that um, keeping well hydrated when you're uh, experiencing the diarrhea, um, also using the, the um, diarrhea management that we encourage using the ammonium, uh, low fiber diets, um, making sure that, um, <clears throat> pardon me, you, um, you know, you're replacing the, the uh, losses. Uh, like Louiselle says, it is very difficult to manage magnesium uh, when you have diarrhea. Um, however, if, if you are managing the diarrhea, you really you are managing the magnesium levels at the same time. Okay, another question, uh, Mona. Yes, um, a question from Jean. I am about to start treatment with Sutant. I am on cholesterol and heart medication. Will there be interactions? Uh, definitely there could be, depends on which uh, cholesterol medication you're on because not all of them have drug interactions with what uh, treatment that you're on. Uh, blood pressure medication I think was the second one that she mentioned. Um, blood pressure medication you may need to adjust because these agents, if you're talking about sunitinib, pazopinib, exitinib, all of them work on blood vessels therefore they will affect your blood pressure. So you'll have to maintain your blood pressure uh, and you may need to adjust your medication. So it's important maybe to verify your blood pressure at home, keep a diary of it, and when you see your doctor, discuss it with the doctor and then we can make adjustments at that time. 
Um, Dawn, let's talk just a little bit about that before we go to our next question. Patients often tend to hide, or I shouldn't say often, but can hide some of their side effects. The, the worry being that if they mention it, you're both nodding, if they mention yeah. the side effects, that the doctor will take them off the drug and then that's they right. won't have a therapy. Can we talk about that a little bit? Because I think that's very important to kind of get out in the open. Yeah, we always tell our patients that we can only manage you the best if you are transparent with the things that are going on. Um, I do understand that thought process that if I tell the physician I have a side effect, then they're going to cut me off or I'm not going to be have access to taking a medication that, you know, is, however, at the same time, we can't manage the medications effectively if you're not sharing uh, the side effects that you're experiencing. So it's really important, like I said, to explain to your physician what's going on, keeping a really good diary as Luzal had recommended, um, especially with the, the blood pressure medications, um, interacting with the suitant. We know often that patients will develop hypertension or high blood pressures when they're taking the suitant while they're on their cycle. Um, and we often will actually add an additional, we call it a calcium channel blocker, I think amlodipine is the common one, um, to help with high blood pressure. So just making sure again to really share with your um, your healthcare team what's going on and to keep a really good diary of, of all of your side effects so that we can help to manage those and help you manage them within the community setting the best. Great, let's go back to Mona in Quebec. Uh, next question, Mona, please. All right, a question from Brian. Um, so he's asking if all these drugs are all a form of chemotherapy. So they are, um, they're often mis, mis, not misinterpreted, but they're often um, identified as a chemotherapy by a patient, but they're not a chemotherapy. We call them a chemotherapy-like drug um, because of the way they work on a tumor. So as Louiselle had explained in her um, earlier presentation, the sutant, the excitinib, the pazopinib, all of those types of drugs act on the blood vessels in the body. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to restrict blood flow to the tumor as opposed to allowing it to be fed and to grow. So they are not a chemotherapy, but they act like a chemotherapy because of their interaction with a tumor. Good, next question, Mona, please. All right, a question from Mike. He says that his most common issues with student are diarrhea and electrolyte management and GCAPO4. Could you speak? Could you speak to that, please? So uh, again, diarrhea, as Louiselle had explained in her uh, slides, is one of the more common side effects of taking the suitant. Um, we often instruct our patients uh, to use the product Imodium. We found that it works the most effective. Um, we have made a couple of suggestions to our patients and have had the feedback that it works quite well. Um, number one is we call it a, the preemptive strike. So if you were on a cycle, say, 14 days on, seven days off, you know that by day 10, you are starting to develop the diarrhea. We will recommend to patients take the, a dose of ammonium in the morning and a dose of ammonium at night the day before you know when you're going to get the diarrhea. And then we found that the diarrhea is not as um, strong going into that known cycle of having diarrhea. The second um, point, again, hydration along with the taking the emodium, but the second uh, suggestion we make is to use the emodium effectively. A lot of individuals uh, report to us that they'll take a dose in the morning and then they don't really take anything later in the day because, you know, they're, they don't want to take more medications. The Imodium only works as effectively as you're taking it. So when you get that first bout of the loose stool, not a loose stool, but a watery stool, you take your first two doses and then you would take one immediately every time you have uh, a bout of the, of the uh, watery diarrhea and you would stop once the diarrhea starts to become, uh, almost has a consistency to it. It has like formation and then you would stop because I, often our patients will tell us then they transition to becoming constipated. So it is a fine balance. It's learning your body. It's learning how these um, management tools work best. But again, it's keeping track of, uh, of, of how it works. And again, that diary is really important. Um, and again, you can take the Imodium uh, up to, to eight doses a day. 
what would you advise a friend, um, well, a kidney cancer patient whose friends are telling them to take natural products um, and like the last thing they've heard of was shaga tea, um, bearing in mind that they might be taking other drugs for health issues. Let's go to uh, Louise L for that, please. Uh, those are always very challenging questions because drugs, as we know, go through clinical trials and we know exactly, well, we know more about how they work, what interactions they have, how they're metabolized, how they're eliminated, where they act. With these natural products, they really don't go through that rigorous testing. So it's difficult for us to say, yes, there's a drug interaction or no, there's not a drug interaction. So really, um, we try to encourage patients that are on some anti-cancer agents to stay away from some of those products while they're on the anti-cancer medication. If they want to do it afterwards or on their weeks off, maybe they can do it at that time. But really, because we know so little about these agents, they are just not tested. And a lot of the times, these agents can have contaminants in them that we just don't know anything about. John? Yeah, I have to, I have to um, emulate what Louise Al has saying as far as taking um, the, the natural products um, we don't know enough about them. We don't know what type of interactions they can have with um, the uh, the our chemotherapy like drugs, um, and it, it is much more safe to remain um, true to the program in the sense that you take the medications as prescribed and take your other medications that you are required for other we call those comorbidities, so your heart medications, your thyroid medications, and so on and so forth, and um, you know, on the days that when you're off, you could take and, and you know, use uh, your, your vitamins and your natural products then, but not to, um, not to have them co or interact with the, with the, uh, the therapies that you're taking. We want them to be, in, and we always say in, in our clinic, um, that we want to, um, we want to make the, say, Sutent, um, we want to get the most out of it and we know we're going to get the most out of that drug if we're taking it the proper way and not uh, bringing in another um, agent that could potentially impact its uh, effectiveness. Okay, let's uh, go to Mona for another question, please. Okay, so it's a question from Brian. Um, uh, Brian, if I'm not saying... I'm sorry, but I, like I'm just cutting out. I haven't heard the last part of that conversation at all. Okay. All right. Um, so I was just Sorry. saying, Brian, if I don't get your question right, just type it in again. Um, he wants to know, how does a doctor determine how, um, on what drug to put you on? Did you get that, Louisa? No, I did not. Maybe okay. you can repeat the, the, it. The question is, how does a clinician decide what drug to prescribe for a patient? Still lost it completely. Okay, maybe we try Dawn. Maybe okay. Dawn can answer. She seems to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, sorry, Louis Al. Um, so when a patient uh, first has their consult or visit with the um, the oncologist, um, they will uh, discuss the the tumor type. They'll discuss um, uh, the. Uh, and often these are patients who have what we call metastases, so it has started in the kidney and has moved elsewhere. And uh, typically, though, the, it, it, we usually go to the first-line treatment, which is, again, we've mentioned this drug before, the Sutent or the Excitinib. Um, those are typically the first um, uh, inter or, uh, therapies that we would um, t look at as far as uh, treating the, the, uh, the renal cell carcinoma. And then we would... Um, routinely do scans to to see how that tumors or how the tumors are reacting to the treatment and then going forward based on whether there's progression or regression then we would consider then other lines of treatment um, accordingly. Okay. Um, choice though I think it's important we're always uh, talking here at Kidney Cancer Canada about choice that is that is a discussion that I think the patient should be having and most of the clinicians that I know within the kidney cancer world environment are very open to having that discussion about yes. 
why a drug should be chosen. And if the patient is adamant that another drug, they would like to try another drug, the, the clinician generally, unless they, they believe there's going to be adverse side effects, will uh, facilitate that, that request. Am I, am I correct? Absolutely. I mean, really, it, it does come down to the, it is the patient's choice. Yeah. Louiselle? Or Louiselle? And I think that one of the first questions you really need to ask your physician is why they suggest that one and is it, why is it appropriate for them. And also, are there clinical trials that they could go on? Maybe not right at the beginning, but eventually they may need a clinical trial or there may be some clinical trials at one point that they would get benefit from. So really upfront, they need to discuss that with their clinician. We'll take one more question, then we're going to move on to the second part of our uh, presentation. But don't worry, everyone. We will make sure that we'll get more questions in uh, a little bit later. Uh, one more question. Uh, do you have another one, Mona? Well, I do, but the two others that I have are on immunotherapy. So I'm wondering yeah. whether we should, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's hold off. So um, Dawn, I'll just get you to take a bit of a break now, if you'd like. And uh, Louise Zell's going to move on with uh, immunotherapy. and. Uh, I will put the slides up there uh, on the screen. The slides up there. Go ahead. Okay. So immune oncology are usually injectable drugs, so you would have to. Okay. So immune oncology are injectable drugs that you have to get infused in a cancer center or a private clinic or somewhere where there is uh, access to your veins. So you can't take them orally at home. And what happens is these, these drugs stimulate your own immune system to really attack the cancer. And what happens with a cancer that's been around, it, needs, it, needs, it knows how to hide from your immune system. So we're going to try to boost your immune system to attack your tumor again. So these drugs are interferon, interleukin, nivolumab, and ipilimumab. Now, nivolumab is probably the newest kid on the block and has been used quite frequently, whereas ipilimumab is only in clinical trials for kidney cancer at this time. It's available for other types of cancers at this time, but it's going to be avail in research in clinical trials right now for kidney cancer. So uh, you may hear from this drug for a while. Some of the drug interactions, again, that you have to look at are decreased effect, increased effect, increased side effects. With these drugs, you don't really need to worry about food interactions because the food um, the drug is given directly into your bloodstream, not so it doesn't have to go through your drug, uh, your uh, GI tract, your gastrointestinal tract. But you also have to look at environmental side effects or toxicities or interactions, which increase side effects. And usually, again, your sun sensitivity is important in that respect. Also, they may cause rash, and they may cause other problems that can be warranted by. Uh, worsened by the sun. Some of the the drug, some of the side effects that these drugs cause, are, again, are because your your system is inflamed. So you may get diarrhea because your gastrointestinal tract is inflamed, or you may get some rash or some itchiness because your skin is inflamed, or you may get some weakness or some hand and foot difficulty, and because that's a neurological, maybe your your uh, your uh, tumors are affecting, or your drugs are affecting your neurons. Your, and then again, fatigue, headache. Usually, these are endocrine effects. So we will be testing all this. Your endocrine effect. Where we'll be testing for your blood sugars. We'll be testing for your thyroid gland to see if these are affected by these agents. And we can manage these side effects. We just need to know that they're happening. And questions. Yes, so the first question is from Marianne. Her husband is uh, on cabozantony. Um, he, he needs, um, he's taking antibiotics for a throat sinus infection. And she's wondering how these anti antibiotics in interact with the TKIs. Uh, that's a question that depends on the metabolism of the antibiotic. Some of these, uh, the cabozantinib is metabolized by a certain enzyme in your liver, and some antibiotics can either increase the enzyme or decrease the enzyme. So if you're increasing the enzyme, you're decreasing the effect of your cabozantinib, or vice versa. So that is something that 
needs to be looked at um, by a pharmacist at some point. So when you see your clinician, it is so important that you bring all your drugs with you so that someone can look at that and say, oh, worry, or no, there's not a problem, go ahead, continue with this. And sure, you always have a list of medications with you. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you, some people uh, don't like carrying all their drugs around, so a great way of doing it is grabbing your cell phone, yeah. by the way, putting a list in there, or even snapping pictures of the fronts of the bottles or the, the medicine containers so you've got them, And uh, uh, because sometimes we get confused, we may not write the drug number down correctly, so it's always a good idea to do that. Okay, uh, next question, Mona? Can uh, a question? Oh, I have another comment. Go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Um, a lot of the antibiotics can also cause diarrhea. So be careful when you're on these agents because you can have double whammy diarrhea. And uh, just be careful and manage your diarrhea very well. Okay. All right. Well. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is um, Can immunotherapy, is a question from Jean, can immunotherapy be used as first line treatment? In Canada, first line treatment with immunotherapies is only in clinical trials. Right now, we are using them only as second line. So you would have an or you would have had an oral agent as your first treatment, and if you are becoming intolerant or you're progressing on that one, then we would probably consider an immune therapy. Again, depending on the type of person you have, if you have other immune um, diseases such as Crohn's disease or uncontrolled diabetes or some of these, you may not be the best candidate for these immune therapy because we're going to boost your system and these diseases are going to get out of control. Mm -hmm. Talk a bit about uh, efficacy and side effects, uh, the two combined. Mm -hmm. I'll go to Dawn first. That uh, We were having a discussion a couple of weeks ago. Uh, about the perception that if you do not get side effects, then the drug isn't working. Yeah, that that one is always a is a bit of a challenge with the patients to get them to understand that we want you to have side effects. It's almost like an oxymoron. We want you to have a side effect because then we know the drug is working. But we don't want you to have a side effect to the point where it's impacting your quality of life. So we know that uh, these agents are working within the system if you get, um, say, the oral mucositis, so the, the soreness or the sensitivity in the mouth, one month, but then the next month you may not get that, but you may get a small rash or you may get heartburn. We are expecting patients to experience the side effects, but again, it's a, it's a fine balance between having a side effect to know the, the drug is being effective in the system, but yet maintaining a quality of life. Again, that's going back to our previous, one of our previous questions about ensuring that you are very transparent with your healthcare team, that you're sharing about those side effects, you're keeping a really good di diarrhea. Because again, we're, we are encouraging you to, to you know, continue on and, and to live life, as they say, and to be within your community and, and remain in, out in the home, in your home and in the community by giving you the agents to, to support you, but you also have to be managing those agents as well with, again, the diary, uh, the, uh, diary and the yeah. Um, discussions, yeah. But some patients can have lesser, uh, lesser side effects than others, right? I mean, it, it varies That's absolutely from patient right. patient. Yeah, so you'll have patients who will come and, in and... and Sorry, go ahead, Louise Al. No, go. I was just I was going just to say, say yeah. some of those side effects are for oral therapies. We don't see as many of those side effects with the immune therapies. So we can't guide the efficacy of an immune therapy by side effects. We need to do the scans to look at how you're responding yeah. with the immune therapies. Okay, let's go back up to uh, Quebec. Uh, Mona, you have another question for us. Yes. Um, can the sutin decrease your immune system, making you more susceptible to infection? Um, sutin can decrease your white blood cell count and your platelets, and we need to monitor those. 
So yes, it, it could possibly make, be making you more sensitive, but it's not one of the common side effects. It's something that we will be monitoring on a monthly basis to see. And again, if, if your white blood cells, and the white blood cells are the cells that fight infection, are decreased, we may need to adjust your dose. And again, it's not to say that it's not going to work as well if we're adjusting the doses. It's just, again, as Don said, it's the fine balance between efficacy and toxicity. We need to watch for that. And I think I'll just add to that. I think it's really important, too, that patients remember that when we do blood work, it's always when you're off the suited, because this question was pertaining to suitin specifically. So it's always when you're off the therapies that we do your blood work um, so that we can see how your body is responding when the drug is not in your system. Um, and therefore, we would manage all of the hematologic or your, your blood work levels um, and specific blood work levels to ensure that um, you, you are, are maintaining a hematologic balance. Um, if you could just, uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll get to another couple of questions in a minute, but let's just talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the, some of the, the compliance issues. And uh, it, it, it sounds like, you know, it, uh, a parent saying to their child, take your medicine uh, on a regular basis or otherwise, uh, you know, it, it won't get better. But one of the challenges when you are on these drugs is to make sure that we, we in the clinical environment, we do it called compliance, and that means taking them on a regular basis and making sure you record them. Louiselle, I, I hope you can hear me, but uh, I'll, maybe I'll get you to just uh, offer your opinion on that first. Well, compliance is difficult to assess. It's difficult for us if you don't tell us that you've missed doses. We may see that you're not, the either the drug is not working enough, but you've not told us that doses have been missed. So we may may come to some conclusions that are not correct or vice versa if we've asked you to decrease your dose but because you're so scared that the drug is not going to work you've not decreased it but you're getting into toxicities again we assume that the dose that we've given you again is too toxic and will decrease again or we may even say well it's it's just too toxic for you we're going to have to change your therapies so Compliance is important. You need to take it as directed as you've been told because, again, as Dawn said, we can change the, the schedule. The schedule is how you take it, whether you take it for two weeks at a time, three weeks at a time, four weeks at a time, or even uh, we have some patients who take it one week and then off for a week because that's what their body can tolerate. It's not to say that it's not efficacious, but it's the way it needs to be taken for that particular patient. So compliance is very important. You, you, can't, you have to be so transparent with us because we can assume the wrong thing if you're not telling us how you're taking it. Go on. Yeah, I think I, I would only repeat what Luzal was saying, um, but would add as well, if there is at any time, because it is a choice, it's a patient's choice as to how they want their therapy be, to be managed. Um, that if you do need a break, that there isn't, um, you know, there there isn't anything wrong with saying to your to your healthcare provider, your your oncologist, I just need a break because I'm I have been experiencing a lot of fatigue, or the diarrhea has caught up with me, or better yet, you know, I have a vacation that's coming up, and and I know it's gonna you know maybe contain a, a large part of walking or otherwise. And, and just let the physician know and let your healthcare team know, you know, that this is something that you need in order to maintain. And again, we're going to go back to that same comment, which is about a quality of life, because really that's what we're trying to maintain is a quality of life. Right. Well, we're going to try to get all of, to all of your questions. Let's go back to Mona. Mona, next question, please. Yes. Um, a question from Marianne. Is it okay to take the flu shot while on oral treatment? Good question. So, yeah, so we, there's no, we're reason. probably, yeah, yeah, I, we're, we're going to be the biggest advocates here for that. There's absolutely no reason, as Louiselle's probably about to say, not to take the flu shot, um, as well as the, um, the uh, um, uh, pneumococcal vaccination as well, and the um, shingles vaccination. However, it is always best, and please correct me, Luzel, is to take those injections when you're off the suitant or whatever therapy that is that you're taking. 
Louiselle? It's also, it's also important to verify if you're taking the oral drugs versus the immune therapy drugs because the immune therapy boosts your system, these vaccines boost your system. But there is no reason why you cannot take a, a, what we call a, attenuated vaccine. It's not to take a, a, a live vaccine. The live vaccines are your flu shot that is not a shot, that's actually the nasal spray. The nasal spray is a live vaccine, and for those who are in, on immune oncology, uh, immune therapies should not take the nasal spray. You really need to take the shot. Sorry to say uh, it's another uh, injection, but it, it has to be a shot. Not to, do, not to disparage <laughs> any uh, clinicians here, uh, but um, some of these, um, the, these drugs are not as familiar in uh, rural areas to... Um, community docs and, and such and I'm, I'm 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 catching my words here and uh if they get into that challenge and start getting prescriptions from those community docs from uh, the gps do you have any recommendations for them uh, I, I mean uh, just to check in and uh is there a number they can call or a phone number that they can can dial just to make sure that there's going to be no interactions i'll start with louise l please um, well, we know that all the immune therapies are the ones that have the biggest interactions with vaccines, and they have to be given in a center. So they really need to check with their clinician or their nurse or whoever is administering or even the pharmacist in that center to say, is this vaccine adequate? And a vaccine can be taken. It doesn't have to be taken that day. You can have a few weeks to check it out. So, yes, I would do with the oral agents, they would need to speak to the pharmacist, whoever is dispensing that drug to them, and, and chat with them and make sure that the information is not uh, contraindicated. And if that pharmacist can't really help them, they can call any of the, ac the academic centers, the big centers, and that pharmacist will get put through to a pharmacist or to a drug information center or to a center that will be able to answer that question. Uh, Dawn, anything to add on that? Yeah, we always encourage our patients if they, um, and we do receive quite a few of the rural patients here at the center, um, as I'm sure Louiselle does uh, in uh, um, Ottawa, correct? Um, so um, we always encourage our patients to, you know, they can always call the, the here we have a nursing line. So we have the uh, nursing staff who are, have the skill, the judgment, and the knowledge to answer those questions. So that patient can always put either the pharmacist and or the physician in touch uh, with us, and we're more than happy to answer those questions and to uh, validate or to clarify, I should say, not validate, but to clarify that information. And we often do get ca calls from physicians, from, from family physician offices, asking those very questions. Uh, let's go back to uh, Quebec. Uh, Mona, next question, please. Yes, a question from Brian, who is a um, 12 year, five time metastatic RCC patient who's never had any other treatment other than surgery and radiation. So he's wondering why no drugs or immuno immunotherapies? So um, I'm just going to jump in. One of the, the challenges that we have without a, a medical examination. Uh, our uh, panelists are not able to offer a diagnosis. Uh, so I'm sure this question is now going to, the answer is going to come back to you in generalities, but uh, it's not specific uh, to your case. Just, I, I need to say that, and uh, that should be a question you should be asking, um, asking your oncologist. Let's go to Dawn first, please. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're today speaking of, you know, uh, common side effects and management of those side effects and, and really what are these drugs that we're dealing with um, as far as treatment. But um, again, you would be, uh, we, would, we would not be doing you right if, if we were to say this was the reason why you're not getting a specific treatment over another treatment. So again, I, I do agree with Stephen that it is far better to, um, at your next clinic visit, um, to ensure that you have those conversations with your physician to talk about um, you know, your trajectory of care and to get a, a, a better understanding as to what that uh, oncologist plan is for you um, outside of, 
you know, um, again, just asking those questions when you go. Yeah. And uh, Brian, uh, I, I would say that if you have um, a specific question or the region you're living in, if you have any challenges, please reach out to us at info at kidneycancercanada.ca. We can hook you up with uh, someone in peer support or we can uh, maybe talk to one of our experts to try to, to get your referral to someone if, if you're not currently under care. But I think it's a question that uh, I'm pretty sure from all the oncologists, I know that they would like to uh, do an examination before they would make an actual determination on that. So well, let's go to the next question, please. Yes, so a question from John. He restarted Nevo three weeks ago after an eight month break and his ELP is elevated approximately 344. Um, and his oncologist is questioning whether he can continue with Nevo. What are the dangers of elevated ALP and, it, and is it a side effect? And we should first, for those that are online that don't understand what ALP is, explain exactly what that is. Dawn, please. That's your alkaline phosphatase. So it is a liver enzyme uh, that can be impacted uh, when a patient is either on the, um, the TKIs or the sutins, so excitinib, so on and so forth, and or the immunotherapies. Um, so to answer the question, um, Brian would like to know whether or not he can continue and is this a dangerous thing to have an elevated liver enzyme. Um, you know, it, it, it can be systemically if it does continue to rise, yes, it can become uh, a concerning matter. Um, your physician, your oncologist would be monitoring those levels. Um, we often will keep patients on um, the immunotherapies even with some of these elevations in some of their blood levels. However, um, uh, um, will he continue on it? I, I couldn't, I'll be honest, I can't answer to that directly, but is it a side effect of being on the nivolumab? Yes, it is. It is a uh, one of the more common side effects, and that's why we always do routine blood work before a patient comes for the therapy so that we can be constantly checking um, those elevations and in, in lab values that we know are impacted by taking the immunotherapy treatments. Louis Zell, any comments? Yeah, I, uh, uh, just a single elevation in ALP and only your ALP. If your other liver enzymes or your bilirubin is not affected, usually we will continue therapy, but we might want to decide to monitor your blood work a little more frequently to ensure that it doesn't get worse. So it's not a contraindication to continue therapy, but we need to look at all your blood work and not just one enzyme at a time. Okay, one more question. Let's go up to uh, Mona. Mona? Yeah, I actually have another question after this. <laughs> okay. Um, is it safe to take probiotics while on treatment? Are they effective in, healthy, in helping with good health and side effects from the medication? <laughs> Do you want me to tap that one? <laughs> sure, yeah, go um, for it. <laughs> probiotics. <laughs> probiotics are probably not that efficacious because the amount that you need to take is industrial and most of the pills that we have do not have the proper amount in it. So having said that, they're probably not uh, toxic either or not uh, sort of having a lot of side effects. So um, it depends when you take them. If you're taking an oral agent for your treatment, I would not take them at the same time because again, probiotics can cause diarrhea. So it's another side effect that would be additive as we call them in the world. Uh, whether they work really, the documentation is not that rigorous that says yes or no that they work or they're, they're sort of toxic to you. So I don't know what to answer to that one. It, it's how you feel, but I would definitely discuss it with your clinician before you decide yes or no you're going to take that because it may affect some of the side effects, as I said, but it probably doesn't cause any drug interactions. Dawn? 
John? Yeah, I, I think the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, just a, a good diet, a good proper follow the Canada food guide, um, taking your medications very, you know, routinely. If you always take it at the same time, try and take it at the same time every day, not missing doses and following, you know, the, the good advice of your, of your nursing team and using the management tools that we do give you to. Um, so I think to introduce something extra uh, may not have the efficacy that or the effect that you would think it may have if you're just following a good, you know, good diet and, hi and hydration. And, uh, okay, and great. Next, next question, Mona. Please. All right. Um, a question from Ina. Why do some patients get drug holidays from the drugs? Her father is on long-term suitant, no breaks besides his 14 days on, seven days off. Um, we will give patients holidays, as you, as, as you identified it, for various reasons. Um, typically, though, it's uh, one of two. It's because of... Um, the level of toxicity within the system and the patient just needs to have a quote unquote holiday in order for their body to catch up uh, with being on a therapy for uh, you know an extended period of time whatever that therapy schedule is and number two it could be hematologic or um, some of the lab values that we're looking for are either elevated or uh, uh, depressed and we need to be monitoring that a little closer until again the body has an opportunity to catch up and and why your father has been on a on an extended period um, is, I would say, probably a good thing. Is the fact that it's working. At the end of the day, what you are doing and what the therapy is that is being managed by your healthcare team and by your oncologist is working. And um, you're doing everything. It sounds like it, it, to keep him in a place where he he needs to be as far as his therapy is concerned. So good for you. Well. Uh Unfortunately, that is the end of our time for questions, but uh, I just want to remind people, if you have any unanswered questions, please go to uh, kidneycancercanada.ca. You'll find under the patient and caregiver section there, a section called Ask the Expert, and you can always send us your questions to info at kidneycancercanada.ca, and we will try to get you an answer as quick as we can. Today's webinar is going to be up on the kidneycancercanada.ca website. You can also watch past patient meetings and review some of the answers that were given today. And uh, you also, don't forget, you can get that information about Kidney Cancer Canada um, that you can download under the handout section. If you're in the Vancouver area, or if you're anywhere actually in Canada and you want to jump on a plane, join us for our in-person meeting. It's going to be November the 23rd from 5 until 9 in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. We're pretty excited about this because it's going to be a, a joint meeting with bladder cancer patients. Uh, we're joining together with Bladder Cancer Canada, but we've got some leading kidney cancer experts there. Uh, Dr. Alan So is going to be joining us. Uh, Dr. Peter Black will be there. Dr. Christian Coleman'sberg, who will be talking about survivorship uh, skills and um, uh, medications and diet and exercise. Great opportunity. It's completely free. We'll have uh, light snacks and refreshments, so it's a great opportunity. So that's Thursday, November the 23rd. And we also need volunteers and community ambassadors. We're really trying to. Uh, do a lot more outreach across this country to get to more of those areas where it's a bit of a challenge. We're trying to raise awareness of kidney cancer in this country. And obviously, if the more we can, the, the better uh, chance we have of advocating for new therapies as they become available. So please, if you're interested, again, sign up. And at the end of our seminar, once you uh, sign off today, once we close it, there will be a very brief survey. I'd really appreciate it if you'd fill it out. Just let us know what you think and the kind of feedback you have. And if you have any other comments, just uh, give it just take a couple of seconds. It'll be a tremendous uh, opportunity. My thanks to everybody for joining us, for you for joining us uh, from your home, your office, or wherever you may be. And a huge thanks to Louis Zelgodbo for doing two webinars today, one in French and one in English from Ottawa. Louis Zell, thanks. Thanks so much. As always, you're a great supporter of kidney cancer patients and caregivers and truly appreciate it. And Dawn, 
from uh, Sunnybrook Cadon Knight. Thanks so much for, for your assistance in helping this to be a success. I know that uh, looking at the feedback that I'm seeing online already, it's uh, been a great afternoon and great evening, and uh, thank you both for, for helping us out today. You're very welcome. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Goodbye, everyone, and uh, we will see you very soon. Uh, our next webinar, by the way, I can tell you, is going to be in January, so watch for that date. It's going to be with Dr. Denny Hang, who's a world-renowned researcher and oncologist, and we'll actually be talking more about clinical trials and how they can enhance your care and what you need to know, so please stay tuned for that. From Victoria, uh, I'm Stephen Andrew, the Executive Director, and from Quebec, Mona Awad is joining us, and she is our communication specialist. We'll leave the number up on the screen for you for a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.